to introduce you. Cheryl Egan Donovan is a film director, writer, producer based in Boston. She's going to show us a clip from her remarkable documentary, Nothing is Truer Than Truth, which is available for your home pleasure viewing on Amazon Prime and Hulu. Cheryl. I'd like to start by thanking the National Press Club for hosting us today. It's uh, quite an honor to be invited here to speak. I'd also like to thank uh, the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship for organizing the event, particularly Bob Myers and Brian Wildenthal, who've done so much work to make this a success. And I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming here today to help us celebrate this important book, Shakespeare Identified. I've been asked to talk about my documentary film, Nothing is Truer Than Truth. And um, I also want to thank many people in the room here who helped with the production of that film. Uh, for me, Shakespeare Identified is the source of the film. Uh, Loney started with a profile of the author. He said, what are the specific characteristics that the author would be required to have to have written these works? And one of the key things he did was identify the author as a lyric poet. Looney was recognized the importance of Shakespeare's long poems and the sonnets as the key to discovering Edward de Vere as the author of the Shakespeare canon. He developed his argument as follows. He found that there was evidence for de Vere as a lyric poet. He looked at the early poems by de Vere. He then looked at the early poems and plays of Shakespeare and identified parallels in both form and content. Now, the early poems of de Vere are often dismissed as juvenilia. They were written when he was a young man, but there are many parallels in form and content. And Looney looked, too, at the sonnets and the themes and structure of the sonnets and decided that the evidence adds up to de Vere as Shakespeare. For me, that was very convincing. Loney finds the sonnets to be of special significance, and Tom just talked a bit about that. But Looney's uh, statement on that was that sonnets as a form are more than any other form of composition, uh, the vehicle for the expression of the most intimate thoughts and feelings of poets. And he notes that by far the larger and more important set embracing no less than 126, out of the total 154, is addressed to a young man and express a tenderness which is probably without parallel in the recorded expressions of emotional attachment of one man to another. I discovered Edward de Vere in a history class at Harvard University. The professor, Don Ostrowski, suggested the authorship question as a topic for an essay on the importance of primary, secondary, and tertiary sources when we try to determine how we understand history. He was the person who recommended to me J. Thomas Looney's book, Shakespeare Identified. <clears throat> Looney's analysis of Oxford's extant poetry and his understanding of Shakespeare's conflicted feelings toward women were the two critical factors that led to my research into the Shakespeare authorship question. De Vere's early poetry and Shakespeare's sexuality are still two of the most controversial topics in authorship studies. Again, his poetry is widely unknown. It's not taught in colleges today. I'm a college professor. I do introduce my students to his work. Um, I'm one of the few people, I think, who do that. And uh, Shakespeare's sexuality has been often, uh, particularly with the sonnets, uh, debated. As, is it important or not? So I had written poetry as an undergraduate, and I had also studied gender identity and sexuality, the themes of that and the characterizations in Shakespeare's work. And so when I read Looney's book, I was convinced immediately <laughs> that De Vere was the true Shakespeare. And I still believe quite strongly, and I've spoken about this at other conferences, that De Vere's early works, his early poetry, demonstrate the development of Shakespeare's voice and the style of his writing. 
So having discovered De Vere, this was in 1997, I looked for other books on the topic. <clears throat> and the first one that I found was Joe Sobrand's Alias Shakespeare. Sobrand made the case that the author's sexual preference was part of why he developed the pseudonym Shakespeare, which was really interesting to me, as I do accept that Shakespeare is a pseudonym. And as Tom said, there are many reasons that authors use pseudonyms, <clears throat> many reasons that Oxford may not have wanted his work to be known. But Sobrin took the position that the publication of the folio itself, which did not include the sonnets, was because he wanted to suppress the sonnets. Uh, it's, uh, that's not he, but the, pub the people who published it wanted to suppress them, it, because it meant, makes no mention of Southampton, to whom all of Shakespeare's major non-dramatic poetry had been addressed. He goes on to suggest that one aim of the folio was to reinvent Shakespeare as a mere untitled common player, thereby dissociating him from Southampton completely and the poems written in his honor, and thereby burying any memory of the homosexual amour that seems to be implied by the sonnets between Oxford and Southampton, because Southampton was still very much alive at the time and to be reckoned with. So Sobern concludes that the 1623 folio deliberately focused entirely on the plays, <clears throat> omitted the sonnets, and reinvented Shakespeare. So I titled my essay for that class, Nothing is Truer Than Truth, after reading Looney's book, because here he introduced the phrase that was translated from Vero Nile Varius, uh, Edward de Vere's motto, clearly a pun on the name Veer. <clears throat> As a writer, I was really intrigued by this character. He had a fascinating life, and I did some more research on what was then the very new internet, and I discovered that a writer from Northampton, Mass., Mark Anderson, was working on a biography of De Vere. I decided then that I would option the book when it was finished, it was still being written, <laughs> to make a film. Uh, Shakespeare by Another Name was published in 2005 to critical acclaim and I feel that it's still the definitive biography of De Vere. Mark's approach was to trace the parallels between uh, De Vere's life and the works of Shakespeare. The Chicago T Sun Times called it a, Jacoby said, it's one of the very best whodunits you'll ever read. I chose to focus on the years 1575 and 1576 when De Vere escaped the confines of life at Elizabeth's court and traveled to Venice and throughout Italy. De Vere had an epic life and Mark's book details that. So many things that happened before he was 25 years old, before he left for Italy, and many things happened after he returned to London. But I felt that that journey to Italy was the key part of his life where he was transformed from this poet into the playwright we now know as Shakespeare. The experiences that he had during that journey, I think, were really critical and formative. Uh, Nothing that is truer than truth, my film introduces Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, as a sort of A-list party boy on the continental circuit who spent a year and a half in Venice and traveling throughout Italy, uh, learning about the Commedia dell'arte and collecting the experiences that would become the works of Shakespeare. We filmed in Venice, Verona, Mantua, Padua, and Brenta, and went to the sites that De Vere visited in 1575 and 76, including the settings for Merchant of Venice, Othello, Romeo and Juliet, and Two Gentlemen of Verona. The film features Shakespeare scholars, actors, directors, including Derek Jacobi, Mark Rylance, Shakespeare and Company founder Tina Packer, and American Repertory director Diane Paulus, and also argues that De Vere's bisexuality is one of the primary reasons for the pseudonym Shakespeare. So we began by going to Venice, where De Vere began his journey when he you know, landed in Venice, he came to a city that was really unlike any other at the time in Europe. It was a cultural crossroads. It was uh, known for its uh, liberality and sensuality and um, was really a place where anything goes, kind of a frontier town. 
Uh, Devere would have visited the ghetto, and we were very fortunate. We had a production coordinator who was a native uh, Jewish young woman who was able to speak the dialect in the ghetto when we, the police came up to us and asked if we had permission to be shooting there, which we did. So that was great. Um, and he also uh, attended the church of Santa Maria Formosa, where we believed he lived, and he likely would have met Gaspar Ribeiro, who was the Gastaldo, or keeper of the Holy Virgin, at the church of Santa Maria Formosa. Now, Ribeiro is interesting because he shares many traits with Shakespeare's Shylock. Uh, Brian Pullen, a professor at the University of Manchester, has done extensive research um, about Ribeiro and the parallels between Ribeiro and Shylock. Uh, Titian. So Tom mentioned Titian and the painting uh, of Venus and Adonis. So, so while De Beer was in Venice, it's quite likely that he would have met Titian, who uh, died the next year of the plague, but was still alive then. And his home, Ca Grande, was on the northern side of the island. It was a gathering spot for local artists and patrons. A Titian was sort of a celebrity like a Picasso during the day and uh, his day. And in his studio was this one particular version of Venus and Adonis, where Adonis wears the bonnet that's referenced in the long poem of the same name. <clears throat> Uh, we followed De Vere's trail to Mantua, where he would have gone to the Cathedral of Santa Maria della Grazia to see the tomb of Castiglione, and uh, also to the Gonzaga's Palazzo Ducale, uh, where the Appartamento de Troia, again, which Tom has mentioned, um, had the frescoes on the wall done by Giulio Romano. So both of these works, the statue atop Castiglione's tomb, and the Appartamento de Troia are works by Romano and appear in the works of Shakespeare. So here, as I said, are things that De Vere would have seen on his trip that then show up in his writing after the fact. Um, <clears throat> we went to Padua, and on the way to Padua, as De Vere did, we would have passed, we passed the Villa Foscari. The Villa Foscari is located at exactly the same distance from Venice on the River Brenta, as Portia's home, Belmont, is in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Uh, we went to Padua University, uh, where De Vere's tutor, Thomas Smith, taught, and where Ottenello Discalcio, professor of law, provided the model for Bellario in Merchant of Venice. <clears throat> in Verona, uh, we saw more than the makeshift balcony <laughs> of Juliet. Um, we saw the Sycamore Grove uh, and St. Peter's Church, which again is at the actual location um, in the play. And we also saw the home of the Montague family. <clears throat> and then De Vere uh, traveled to Siena. Here he would have met the playwright Piccolomini and seen his play, The Deceived. This play was performed every year on Twelfth Night and is a known source for Shakespeare's work, Twelfth Night. Anyone who saw Mark Rylance in Twelfth Night in New York City had a real treat. It was a fantastic production. We saw, we stood to see it. It was excellent. And um, <clears throat> also, he would, there he would have seen the famous mosaic depicting the 12 ages, ages of man at the cathedral in Siena, referenced by Shakespeare's Jaques in As You Like It. In Palermo, De Vere would have met the Duke of Sessa, who may have introduced De Vere to Cervantes. This is speculation, but the fact that a visitor uh, to Palermo observed that Il Conte, as they call the Earl, challenged the entire city to a duel, uh, reminds one a bit of Don Quixote. So, interesting connection there. So for all of these locations, we have um, people writing about De Vere, traveling there, and then we have De Vere returning to England. So again, as Tom mentioned, on his way back to England, his ship was attacked by pirates. When he returned home, uh, there was a big scandal regarding his wife Anne and her daughter's paternity. He refused to see Anne and instead took up lodging at Charing Cross near London Stone um, with the brother of one of his servants. And 
At that time, several of his early poems had just been published in the Paradise of Dainty Devices. And when he returned home, again, in early 1577, um, two new theaters were just being constructed, the curtain and the theater. The dramatic troupe that De Vere had closest access to was the children's company of choir boys at St. Paul's. And on the evening of New Year's Day, 1577, uh, Westcote led this troupe in a play titled The History of Error. This is thought to be an early version of Comedy of Errors. And then at Whitehall Palace on Shrove Tuesday, February 19th, West Coast Boys ended the season with an encore performance for the court. The Queen's account books list the title as the history of Titus and Gisippus, an ancient story of friendship. It's also known to be one of the principal source texts for Shakespeare's Two Gentlemen of Verona. So this is the story arc that I decided to focus on. He leaves London, he arrives in Venice, he travels throughout Italy, returns home to London, and begins producing these plays. <clears throat> the film is, as Bob mentioned, available now on Hulu and Amazon Prime. It uh, premiered in August, and we are now in talks for global distribution, so we're very excited about that. Right now it's only available in the United States and Canada. And I'd like to just play for you uh, the trailer. What's all this talk about the man who wrote Shakespeare? Wasn't Shakespeare Shakespeare? The case, in fact, has never been stronger that the wrong man has been fitted with the bard's crown. One finds an abundance of correlations between the life of the courtier playwright Edward de Vere and Shakespeare. Edward de Vere did write the works of Shakespeare. The sonnets in particular, for me, they're love poems. I do believe that the author of Shakespeare's works was bisexual. He loved dressing up. He, he loved showing off. In today's parlance, we say he was rather camp. Edward de Vere also had well-documented heterosexual relationships. I think the great majority of men slept with whoever was to hand. Uh, I think Shakespeare was probably the same. There's always been this great question. Why was Shakespeare so enamored of Italy? There's no suggestion that Shakespeare ever traveled outside the southern part of England. De Vere moved to Venice in the spring of 1575 and lived there on and off for the next year. Venice had become perhaps the most vibrant theatrical community in all of Europe. If Shakespeare would have been here, this Shakespeare would have loved. That's where he met Orazio Quaco, who became his page and returned to England with him. And the allegation was that this was for sexual purposes. When you find out about De Vere, he was a swinger. Whoever of the place had to be. It's always been my impression that people in the theater are forced for some reason or other to express themselves behind the mask of pretending to be someone else, perhaps because of nobility and other social strictures. He's able to put himself into every psyche and the constellation of humanity, and that crosses sexuality. This whole business is trying to find out the man, the person, the living, breathing, writing person behind the name. And the journey is fraught and long. Thank you. Thanks, so I just want to uh, thank again Jim Warren for the terrific work that he's done researching Looney's life and the book and his works. and. Uh, Thank John Thomas Looney, too, for introducing me to this really uh, exciting story that um, you, we have so much more to learn about. So does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Uh, the last time, or well, the first time and last time mm -hmm. I attended a conference was in 2006. And one of the presenters said that uh, the sonnets were written by De Vere to his son was 
who was yes. imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with bisexuality, but how to treat the queen so that his head wouldn't be chopped off. Do you, you know about that? I do, yes. And so many people do believe that, that the sonnets are written by a father to a son. And um, I think that although that might explain the, the strong, passionate love <laughs> that's expressed in most of the sonnets, that there is an alternative um, explanation that seems to have some evidence in the plays. There, there are many plays that are considered homoerotic. Um, there are lots of themes of gender identity and uh, lots of strong relationships between men where the woman's role um, is first to come between them and then to perhaps provide a marriage of convenience. You know, marriage between a man and a woman at that time for love, you know, was not really the model. And um, in some ways, Merchant of Venice is different because of that. It has a happy ending where Antonio is going to stay part of the family. <laughs> but um, I feel very strongly, as I said, that this idea that uh, De Vere was bisexual is important to understanding his connection to the works. So I'm well aware of the other theories. Yes. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> did the book by Richard Rowe, Shakespeare in Italy, have an influence on your film? Absolutely, yes. I was very fortunate to meet Richard Rowe. I did actually interview him for the film right before he passed away, and unfortunately he was very ill at the time. Um, but it was a great pleasure to meet him, and I went to the book launch party in Pasadena, which was fantastic. His daughter published the book while he was still there to enjoy that. And so I had it with me when I went to Italy. And so I used it, you know, when I went to um, Verona and to Venice and had it with me the whole time. It's a really terrific book, The Shakespeare Guide to Italy. Thanks. Cheryl, thanks so much. You know, oh, sure. I think one of the things that is so fun in the English language that De Vere played with is that we have but one word, love. Mm -hmm. And the Greeks had eight words for love. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that makes the sonnet so tremendously ambiguous is which word did he mean? English is an impoverished language in this respect compared to Greek. So for example, when a nobleman says, for the love I bear the king, I don't think anyone thinks he's sleeping with the king. I think he means it's brotherly love, right? Unless it's King James. Uh, unless it's King James, <laughs> yes. So that we have in our word philia for Philadelphia. Eros, of course, being sexual love, storage aid for familiar love. Agape for empathetic or universal love. And then Ludus for playful love, uh, so there's self-love, pragma, and madia. But mm -hmm. I'd just like to say, this went mainstream at the Super Bowl. If any of you saw that New York Life commercial, they did put up the four different types of love, Greek loves, on the screen, <coughs> in the middle of the Super Bowl. That's great. So in the sonnet, take that word love, substitute different types of love for it, and see what the interpretations are that you get. Right. I would agree completely that one intent of the sonnets was to uh, address the fact that Southampton was in the tower and that, you know, the author um, clearly had a reason to want him spared. If the author was Oxford, he had a real conflict of interest there. So it's not that that isn't one of the reasons. It's just whether or not Oxford was his father is what I'm questioning. Thank you for making that distinction. <clears throat> yes, Peter. Ask a question. Yeah, getting back to Loney, mm -hmm. uh, on the question of love, uh, he lived long enough to see the Prince Tudor theory begin to emerge, which I believe was the late 30s. But uh, in his book, he, uh, he, I think it's Sonnet 13, with the end couplet, you know, uh, you had a father, mm -hmm. let your son say so. Right. And, uh, you know, the point being is pretty straightforward. A man doesn't uh, refer to himself in the past tense while addressing his own son. So I think Loney, uh, maybe Jim Warren can add more about what Loney thought of the Prince Tudor theory, but it wasn't really crystallized that much while he was still alive. But um, the, um, the father of Southampton was present at his birth at, at Cowdray and wrote a letter expressing admiration for you know, a new heir. So uh, that's all I would say about Loney. Uh, Okay, for me, as I said, Loney was important because of his uh, 
really detailed analysis of the poetry of Edward de Vere. That's how I connected, and that's what made me really interested in this, and so I'm not as interested in, in that particular aspect of the controversy. We, we should not overlook <coughs> the tremendous contribution of Hank Whittemore and the monument mm -hmm. that goes into quite a lot of detail yes. and gives us the evidence that uh, uh, Oxford was, in fact, Southampton's father. I have tremendous respect for Hank. He's, he's a really wonderful writer and a dear friend of mine. And uh, I found the book, The Monument, quite compelling, too. It's, it's probably the most detailed analysis of the sonnets in addition to, you know, besides Helen Vendler's uh, work. But uh, again, I don't know that we have any direct evidence that um, Edward de Vere was Southampton's father. So I'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> Does anyone else want to comment on that? All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Really thank you very much. It. Thanks.